Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 363 for Monday, November 14th, 2022. Greetings, folks, and welcome back or welcome to Gig Gab, the show, as I said, by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you, Mr. Kent? I am remarkably well. We had a great weekend of music and uh, we're heading into the holidays. Life is good right now. That's amazing. That's great. Uh, I like it. That's good. Uh, I saw some news today that I thought was pretty interesting. The um, I, I got a press release from uh, combined press release from South by Southwest and Rolling Stone. Uh, the two of them are partnering on a multi-night showcase to be held at the ACL live theater, which is where all the Austin city limits shows that you see uh, on TV are filmed and held. It's like a 2000, maybe 2,500 seat place. And I've talked about, that's where I saw Dolly Parton earlier this year uh, at South by, they are doing mm-hmm. a three, 14, 15, 16, 17. That makes it a four night uh, music showcase dedicated to emerging artists and Rolling Stone is uh, their editors will collaborate with South by to hand select 20 acts from around the world. So five per night, which makes sense. It's like, that's a normal showcase at South by is to have five bands on the bill each night. How long do they play? Um, Generally it's 40 on 20 off. So they eat, you know, one per hour uh, as the night progresses. And so it, Mm -hmm. my guess is that they're going to do the same thing here. I've never seen this, happened at that theater though the things that have happened there have been the bigger uh events like like dolly parton that's where i saw green day a number of years ago that you know it's people bigger draws uh would be the thing but um but now they're doing this with with you know five bands a night rolling stone is gonna like i said help find the bands and with south by and then rolling stone's also going to use its platform to promote the bands and the event uh, ahead of South by as well. And they say that the plan is for this to become an annual fixture uh, too. So I don't know. It was just, I, you know, it was, it's an interesting twist on South by Southwest to really kind of highlight the focus on upcoming acts, which I like. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I've never been to Austin is the, um, is the ACL theater far from the downtown area or most of, or I don't even know how big Austin is. Got it. Yeah. No, it's a good question. The ACL theater is effectively in the same downtown area. It is. I've certainly walked there from like the convention center in sixth street, you know, and everything else. I mean, it's maybe, maybe like five blocks or something, but, but it's all right there. Like you, you wouldn't take a cab to this if you were at the convention center, because you'd never get there. You know, the the streets are all just clogged up. I've taken like a bird scooter or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's an, it's an easy walk. It's, it's all, it's all right there. Yeah. So it's, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. I was pretty stoked about it. So. Well, cool. I yeah. thought you were going to say bitter pill is going to be playing at it. Uh, bitter pill has submitted to play at, uh, South by this year. I don't believe we've heard oh, back God. from them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have some, yeah, there's, it's, we had an interesting weekend of gigs. Tell me about your weekend of gigs, man. I just had one of those gigs where everything worked, you know, it was one of those weekends where everything worked. I had my, Coffee house gig with my backing band on Friday night. I had an amazing house records gig on Saturday night, and I had a um, uh, a solo on Sunday. So I, kind of my trifecta of things that I do. Yeah, and it was just one of those things where starting on Friday, all were like packed houses. You know, just great audiences to play for, and the and you know when the energy is right, it's amazing how so many things take care of themselves. You know, what it's yes. amazing how people's levels raise how your jokes are laughed at more you know your solos pop a little bit more it was just one of those kind of karmic weekends so you're in tune with the universe yeah yeah i mean it was all just kind of going our way so friday night you know the coffee house gig packed house uh really appreciative we i've added a, a violin player to that um to that repertoire so it's a very different sound which yeah. is just and he's great 
And it's just, it was beautiful. So, you know, a great piano player, our buddy Chris Breen, and then a, a, a violinist, and then a bass player, drums, and me playing acoustic guitar. And it just puts a little different of a different twist on the sound. Energy was great. I mean, even we got three encores, and I think the last wow. one we did, we did, uh, we did Jenny, Jenny, <laughs> and just you know the the violin player is just so smart. He just is so tasteful, and he added to the whole vibe, and it was just it was great. And then we had a club date on Saturday night with the House Rockers. And with the House Rockers, we've last three or four gigs, we've been, hey guys, you know, here are the three songs, bring them a sound check, you know, and uh, and let's see what we can do. Yeah. And uh, we had four songs for this for this one. No, three songs for this. And uh, so Train in Vain by The Clash, which we nailed. And, nice. you know, went <laughs> right into the show that night. We Santa Claus is coming. Oh no, four songs. Santa Claus is coming to town because it's it was our last gig of the year, and I wanted to get something in there, and actually went over great. Sure. Um, uh, Sir Duke, which we just haven't played for a while, but our horn section is just crushes it, and and Don Frank, our new drummer, just laid down the nastiest groove. It was just great. Oh, that's great. And then the other one was New Sensation by NXS which is not a terribly hard song to play, but it's just one of those songs, a really weird roadmap. Yep. You have to know. If you, you don't know, know the song, you don't know the song. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the breaks just come in weird places and that type of thing. And that's pretty much what happened. It sounded great while it was grooving, but you know, we all couldn't agree on, on when to do a break and how long the breaks would be and, and uh, you know, where the choruses would kick. And so, so that one didn't make it into the show that night, but you know, I'd say we give it a seven out of 10, and uh, everybody knows that they're exposed on it. So hopefully the next time you come back and, you know, you don't want to be that guy. Yep. And <laughs> and it gets into the show. So we had uh, the club holds about about 180. And I think over the course of the night, we did about 300. And uh, 70 of it was a wedding party that uh, cut a deal with the venue to come in. You know, kind of a mixed thing. We You know, we got, we got some money for it. But sure. We get, we get the door there, but the concept that, a wedding party gets a cheap band, you know, it's not an exclusive thing, but yeah, you know, I, I feel a little mixed about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's how, it's how it is sometimes, but yeah. yep. But we also took care of business with our own draw and, and sold a lot of tickets. And so that was, that was great. And then Sunday afternoon, nice mellow solo acoustic thing had a, had a cool new guitar I'm playing and uh, it sounded great. Played my thing. Voice held out all three nights. Nice. Go home, took a shower, job well done. Nice. <laughs> what um? What new guitar are you playing? I got. I it, it's something I've always wanted. Was that you know? There's a great um, local luthier named Santa Cruz Guitars, okay. which is they don't make a lot of guitars, but they're they're kind of those custom small run. You know. Yeah. 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 And uh, I got it uh, used. Put a pickup in it on Saturday afternoon, played it Sunday, and was just thrilled with how it sounded. Wow. It was just part of all the good stuff that going my way on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Or all weekend. That's great, man. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. How about you? I had a weekend I don't think I will soon forget, Paul. Um, in we fact, were both I, living like we were no, this was we were both in tune with the universe this weekend. This was a this was a weekend where Gig Gab thrived. Uh, on stage and off. I uh and I, it's actually the whole week. It's weird how things sort of come together. But uh, in terms of the the weekend with the gigs, we played Bitter P Bitter Pill played two nights uh, with opening up for this band Bellas Bar Talk. They're out of Massachusetts. They've been around for I guess about ten years or so. Uh, they, they call them still themselves foot stomping freak folk. So that really fits with our haunted mm. rhythm and bluegrass feel of bitter pill. I mean, we felt that that would fit coming into it. And, and I, to give credit where credit's due and thanks, uh, Jamie Preston, who is one of the new owners of the stone church here in, uh, in New Hampshire, down the street from me, she was the one that, that suggested that we open for Bella's at the stone church, which is what happened Friday night. Bella's then asked us, to follow them to Portland and open for them Saturday night, which was actually the last night of, of a 40 date tour or a 40 day tour. I don't know if they were on the road for 40 days or played 40 dates, but either way, that's, that's, you know, that's a legitimate tour in a long time. 
Um, and they ended that on, on Saturday night at Portland house of music and events. So we played with them two nights in a row and, you know, we got to the club on, uh, on Friday night as they were sort of, you know, in the middle of, and then finishing their sound check so that we could get up and, uh, you know, put our stuff in place and sound check. I used, I used their drummer's kit and uh, Crisco, their drummer is great guy. And it turns out he actually books all of their, or manages most of their logistics on the road. I'm going to have him come on the show and, and talk through some of that with us. I, there's some fascinating mm. things. I was just watch. I was sitting in the green room, uh, before we all played watching him it, on the phone with hotels for that very night, like just trying to sort things out. And it was just, just fascinating to, you know, see how, how they choose to do it and all that stuff. But, um, you know, so we played, we played for about an hour on Friday night, which is what they asked us to do. You know, uh, we don't like to overstay our welcome and man, like the energy in the room was just fantastic. It, it was just like you were saying, you know, everything's just flowing in all the right directions. Uh, the band played well. I would say it's the most relaxed I've ever felt on stage mm -hmm. at the Stone Church, which is odd given that the room, the energy in the room was really high. It was, it was a packed house and people were really into the band, which was so nice to see. Like, you know, a lot of people that had never heard of Bitter Pill before. It was certainly, you know, we, we drew quite a few people to the stone church. Cause it's basically a hometown venue for us. Um, mm. but, uh, but lots of, of Bella's fans who, who really dug what, what happened. And then we get to the club on and, and Bella's was great. I actually stood him, uh, stayed there and, and watched their whole set on Friday night. Fantastic band. Really just great, great band. If you, if it, I, I recommend everybody go, go give them a listen. They really yeah. fantastic music and great live show. Uh, good energy and really like an um, even better fit with bitter pill than I thought it would be like, it's just, it like, it fits like a glove and they, they felt the same way. They, they were telling us that uh, we got to the gig on, on Saturday night and they said, Hey, yeah, uh, yeah. About your set time. We're like, Oh, here, you know, here it comes. We, we overstayed our welcome. We did something wrong. They're like, yeah. Could you play for an hour and a half instead tonight? <laughs> we're like, absolutely. And that's a pretty big room. Portland House of Music and Events. It's uh, it's about 300 people, I think, if it were like packed to the gills. Uh, I think there were about 250 in there, all told on on Saturday night. But it's it's a it's one of these rooms that's kind of like a pit. There's there's a, the stage, and then uh, a, a, a sort of things on the stage level ar around the back of the room and the sides of the room, and then the the like where the people would be pressed up against the stage is down in a little pit. So it really mm -hmm. does kind of push everybody up front, which was great. And the energy there was like, it's certainly in, in my opinion, one of, if not the best gig we've ever played. We just, nice. everybody, you know, the sound was good yeah. um, on stage and off. Everything was just perfect. The band was playing really well. The energy was good. We had Riley, the trombone player from Bellas Bartok sit in with us for a couple of tunes and that was fantastic. Uh, just, just a like spectacular night. Uh, both nights were spectacular. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really good. So we'll, we'll almost certainly wind up playing some shows with them going forward to, um, you know, whenever, whenever we can make that work. Cause it's just such a good fit. And they felt the same way. You know, we, we were saying to them, we've been looking for another band that would, you know, fit with us. And they're like, yes, yeah, same. Um, I, I would say that the energy in the room, both nights, I said this to Lisa, in fact, my wife on Saturday or on Friday at the stone church. And then Saturday was even more this way. It's the first time that I felt the same energy that I, that I felt in rooms when I played with hypnotic Clambake since I left that band, it's that kind of zany and it's all similar vibes to the music kind of based in like roots music and tradition music and folk music. And, uh, you know, all of that sort of mixed together with a rock and roll energy. Uh, but, but, you know, really kind of meticulous about the you give me video. Um, there are some little videos floating around from, from that night. Yeah. Uh, so I'll make sure one of them makes it to our gig gab Facebook group for sure. But uh, yeah, put it up there. That'd be great, Yeah, man. It was, it was great. Really? I'm I, happy. Good. Yeah. I, I have a feeling if, if we, if we play our cards, right, 
we will be able to look back on this weekend as a, you know, a pivot point for bitter pill. Um, nice. It, yeah. We, we were able to open up. I mean, our, we saw, uh, you know, more and more people following us on all our various socials. Like it was, it was a great opportunity and, and we have the, it, it is an opportunity that we can capitalize on. And I, I have some thoughts about that. When I said the whole week sort of came together, I, 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 something, I, I did something earlier in the week that I want to talk about in turn that, that really got me thinking about the conversation that we recently had about the business of, of being in a band, but I'll, I'll, I'll save that for a little bit here. Cause we got a lot of feedback from you folks about our episode last week that I want to make sure we get to here. Well, I have two things I want to do. First thing I want to ask you. So, so yeah. bitter pill, unique, cool, has it stacked together? Like are all the guys and women in the band on the same page? Like would that band tour? I, yeah, I, I think so. We've had the conversation. Um, I don't know how long we would agree to go out on tour. We've talked about doing like a two week thing. There's, there's an opportunity. Somebody out in Arizona wants us to, to play. And so we talked about, all right, well we can, you know, start out there and sort of meander our way back and do this. So yes, I, I think so. I, I think so. Uh, you know, and you and your life, you, you know, I guess you're an empty nester now and, but yeah. you know, you've got your business stuff, but your life is organized in such a way. If, if the opportunity comes, you could do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Two weeks would be easy. A month would be doable, uh, you know, with the right notice and all of that. And I, I'd be very interested in, in making it happen if we could. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck. Thanks. You know, come to California. Uh, well, you know, that like baby steps, man, baby steps. <laughs> All right. I did want to share one other thing. I, I went to a, a live show first, my first live show in a while last night. Yeah. I am a huge fan of the singer songwriter, Ryan Adams, not yeah. Brian Adams. No, I know what you not, mean. Yeah. Yeah. I freaking love that guy. He is he, he, the guy poops amazing songs. I mean, <laughs> he's so prolific and his voice is angelic and he is he is the ultimate singer songwriter. However, show last night was a trip. He has been on tour. He had some. He was accused of some personal improprieties. Got it. That yeah. derailed his career for a while, and he was very public about uh, on via social media about wanting his career back and his life back and the you know financial ruin that it was creating. But he. As organized, you know, went through a couple managers, getting back to a place where he could, you know, repair his image and, and get out there. And again, I, I think this guy is a freaking genius. I mean, just so many amazing songs. Anyway, I was so happy he came to my part of the world to, to play in yeah. this amazingly great sounding theater. And uh, just him, most 80% uh, of the show is him on a guitar. And twenty less, maybe on uh, him on a on an uh, upright piano. Now I've seen him twice before, but with bands and fun shows. He has a reputation of being somewhat. I don't know if mercurial is the is the right thing, but you know, he's a trip. Sure. And this show, this show, he was a trip. I mean, he has Munier's disease, which means he's extremely sensitive to blinking lights and flashes. And so you get several warnings as people come in, please no, no flash photography, you know, or video and, and, you know, people do it. And then, you know, isn't, to some isn't degree, that what Huey Lewis has too, but for him, it affects his he ability to hear. Is that right? It, it affected Ryan's ability to hear for a while. Okay. And he's been rehabilitated enough where it just causes seizures now. So, I, you know, he, he, he can play. <laughs> that sucks but, that uh, that's the step up, but sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So, you know, the first time someone does it, he'll kind of, moderately chastised, but directly say not cool. It's going to cause me problems. Yeah. But you know, there's enough audience interaction where it starts to be uncomfortable. On top of that, he had kind of a playful fight with the lighting guy. He didn't do a, a tech rehearsal and uh, he didn't like the lights and he was calling to the lighting guy and it, just too much of it. He was having a lot of tuning problems with the guitars and he was calling for his tech to come out. Oh, he said he wasn't feeling well, and so he wasn't going to talk so much, but he was going to go for the record for a number of songs. He, and he actually did that. He played 41 songs, three hours. I didn't, it, it got to the point where I didn't know what was going on and if the show was going to end, <laughs> whether he was going off the deep rails. 
but he played an amazing set list. Yeah. He actually had one point in time and he would do stuff like kind of like step away from the mic and curse or, 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 you know, end a song short and, and it was just weird and affected. And then he actually, he left the stage. He said, I'll be right back. And he just went off the stage, you know, for four or five minutes and then came back on. I don't know if you got to go to the bathroom or whatever, whatever the deal was, but it was just weird. And it was all just intensely affected. And then someone about 80% of the way through the show had some lights on him. And he said, if I have to, I'll come into the stage and, and body slam you. Oh. I mean, it, 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 then it got weird, right? That's weird. And yeah, in between that is the most divine music that I could imagine. I mean, his, his voice is just soaring and his guitar playing is so dynamic and just so interesting. And the songs are so beautiful. And Terry was with me. Yeah. And, you know, we finally left. We didn't stay till the end of the show. It ended up going, I didn't know what was going on, but it went over and over and it felt longer because these interludes in between were so uncomfortable. Yeah. Anyway, I get home and I'm looking to see, somebody has got to have noticed this, right? And his fans are like, oh my God, great set list. That's amazing. Literally nothing about the weird behavior. And I'm a pretty big fan of his, I, but I don't, I think his fans give him give him that space that he's that guy. He's this kind of emotionally, I'm not going to say emotionally challenged. He's just kind of this emotionally charged guy. Sure. And that's part of what you get, but it was so much. I was uncomfortable and my wife was uncomfortable and we left, we left with about four songs to go, not knowing how many songs were. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like you get the list. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it was a weird, it was an interesting thing. I mean, you know, fans will forgive a lot. I mean, I clearly, you know, I've forgiven his, his, his personal foibles from, from pre COVID time. Sure. And they're encouraging him, you know, strongly, but it was so weird to me. And I've read nothing about it online that anybody else has said anything. He posted the set list and most people are like, Oh my God, you played this, you played that 41 songs. You're incredible. And, and, and nobody who was there has shared. This was an incredibly mixed experience except for me. Yeah. And um, I feel like so I, it was that, kind of a weird thing. That's how I felt after that sting concert with the, with the, I'll call it from a sting standpoint, the lackluster drummer. Like, I mean, he was fine, but he wasn't mm -hmm. what I expected. And like nobody, I, I, once I started talking about it, people were like, oh yeah, that was weird. But like, it's like, why is nobody talking about this? It's bizarre to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, interesting times, my friend, not everybody can be, can play as in tune with the universe as you and I got to, to be this past weekend. So we've all had our, everybody have their moment, right? We've all had our moments. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. 41 songs. That's a lot. That's like a, like, why would you have to do that? Like if, if you're at that level, you know, I could see. I thought at the time that he, that he sensed that the discomfort in the audience and he was good. He was determined to win them over and give them something that might've been actually what's happening. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, when he would play four or five in a row, you would be stunned at how beautiful it was. Sure. And then when he would go from the piano back to his stool to play guitar and have a moment to interact with the audience, it was awful. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was awful. Yeah. Yeah. He, maybe he shouldn't be, um, he shouldn't be talking to the crowd, maybe. Well, I, I'll tell you, it, it's kind of the, the, the Uber lesson about all the stuff we always talk about, right? Like it's a business yes. and a business has a market and a, you know, and you have customers and, you know, if you're awesome at stuff, your customers will put up a whole lot. There's something to be said for, this is what you get with Ryan Adams. You get the most beautiful music and you get the most challenged you know, experience watching him on stage yeah, and his market accepts that and buys that and happily buys that. And he's just being himself and he's going to ride that, you know, should he have learned some lessons from other aspects of his life? You May know, and maybe, but he's having success. So I don't like, you it. know, like what, do, what parts can you change and the formula still works? Right. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a great singer, but I try to play to my strengths and I have a band that accentuates my strength. And now I have a market and now I have some customers and you know, you do that and you can be successful in business as in any business. Yeah. Some people do it intuitively. Some people do it strategically. 
Some people stumble into it accidentally, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, who knows? Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. If you have any thoughts about any of this, let us know. If you have any questions, let us know. And that's where listener Michael sent in a note to us about last week's conversation we had about how often do you rehearse? When do you rehearse? What's your rehearsal strategy? And Michael writes in and he says he plays mostly classic rock and a little country uh, in a cover band in the Dallas Fort Worth area. He says, we have only done rehearsals if we have a sub uh, for one of our four primary players. We've gotten pretty good at figuring out songs that we can add on the fly. We'll discuss before a gig and may decide to drop it that day if someone doesn't feel confident. He says, our wives give us good constructive feedback ranging from never do that again to I thought you've always played that. Last gig, he says, we added Sar standing there, uh, obviously by the Beatles and low by Cracker. He says, we especially love taking an audible from the crowd, usually later in the night, that we've never tried. It's hit or miss, but as long as we've already got the crowd in our hands, it's a lot of fun when it hits. So, yeah, interesting. Thoughts on uh, I love I love the wife litmus test. That, yeah. That's the ultimate proof right there. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I, I can see that working. The, the, the one... The one issue I have with this, I've certainly been in bands where that's been the MO is you just, you know, learn your parts and then we'll sound yeah. check it maybe. Right. You know, and, and if everybody feels confident, we'll just, we'll just roll with it at the gig. It's fine. Uh, what you don't get to do is um, come up with different arrangements, put medleys together, like the the creativity that can happen when you start looking at things and have some downtime where you're not under the microscope or under the spotlight can be helpful. Uh, you know, I made a comment that, that I don't think is all that fair and I don't think is accurate, but I'll share it anyway because it, uh, it, it, it communicates perhaps where this goes. My first thought was no rehearsals are fine if the show isn't about you. I'm not convinced that's, Correct. I think there's plenty of bands out there that don't rehearse that are just putting on shows for the band, but certainly for like a wedding band or something like that, you can easily get away with the no rehearsal thing. Once you've got the band up and running, you probably need some rehearsals. Like he said to, you know, get rolling, but, um, but you know, like it, it, you know, if you're just learning songs for the sake of adding songs and all of that. Yeah. But I, I feel like there is, it's doable, but you're missing things. I don't know. That's, mm -hmm. that's my, that's where, that's mm -hmm. where I fall on this one. Listener Adam uh, wrote in, this is Adam Moskovitz from the VAM band. He says, uh, we haven't held a rehearsal since March of 2020. He says, three years ago when the band was just getting started, we did rehearse weekly to build up our initial song list. And that was foundational for the project's current success. That was before we started performing with in-ear monitors and tracks, which we started doing about a year ago. It has been a lot of work, mostly on Adam's part, I think, to set up and tweak to his band's exact needs, BPM changes, mashups, and all of that. But it's been a total game changer, he says, in many ways. Number one, no more rehearsals. No more texting everyone to plan rehearsals, trying to line up different people's schedules. Nobody has to drive and set up and break down their gear. No gas money spent. No rehearsal room rental. He says, currently, we have about 70 tunes in our repertoire and about 12 of those were added throughout this year, 2022, often played live on stage for the first time. Objectively, he says these songs are always much stronger the 10th time we play it versus the first. But I strive to inject in a new tune about once a month to keep things fresh and fun and exciting musically. And also for people who come to see us multiple times. He says it's incredible how one new song in a show can magically freshen up everything else. He says... I do love studying and learning music and it's very beneficial as a band leader to have more song options for various types of gigs and crowds. Uh, he has, I mean, let me see. He says, uh, well, you know what? Let me play. Well, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read his explanation of these tracks that he uses. Cause I think this is not for everyone. You have to be willing. Well, at least one person in the band uh, has to be willing to dedicate time to creating these things. And I have a little sample we can play for you so that you really get an idea of what this is like. But he goes to karaokeversion.com uh, to download multi-track stems of every song they play. 
And that allows him to easily mute or unmute any individual tracks to create custom snapshots for each instrument. He says, for example, Uptown Funk minus drums as a practice version and Uptown Funk plus drum 60 B louder as the learn version. Uh, mm -hmm. He said, right. You know, he says the tracks can contain arrangement cues throughout, which makes it very easy for a musician who's familiar with the basic form and chords to, of any tune to play it successfully without any train wrecks and sound really tight. And he says, when I have a new musician or a sub, I send them the link for their instrument and I send the set list for the specific gig and I tell them to practice and prepare on their own time and they show up at the gig ready to go. It's the most convenient, fits everyone's lifestyle and every track is the right BPM, the right key, the right arrangement. And it's the ultimate practice tool. And he says it, it, it takes talented musicians who will do their homework, but it works. And so you mentioned Sir Duke, Paul. So I'm going to, I'm going to play uh, his track that the drummer would hear for Sir Duke. And let's see what Sir we get Duke here. Sir Duke in B. Intro. Two, three, four. Repeat. Right? And then it'll say full band comes in. And if we <laughs> listen through to the track, it's going to say verse, chorus, stop, uh, I, I, I had also listened to long train running, uh, by the Doobie brothers and the, that track works the same way. It's like, okay, here's the guitar intro drums, go bass, go, you know, that whole thing. So if you know what you're doing, you can follow this and you, there will never be a train wreck, but it requires everybody to be on ears, everybody to be, you know, to play in, uh, in very good time. I would imagine it requires yep. a drummer who's super comfortable with a click, but but I think everybody's here in the click through the, through the gig. Uh, so, it, you know, it's, you just got to be used to that, but it's an interesting thing. Like as soon as I heard this, I was like, all right, well, this does sort of solve that problem of, you know, if you want to do a medley or a mashup, well, as long as Adam constructs it the right way with the tracks, well, you're, you're good to go. You know, Adam is, um, probably one of the most constant commenters to us. He sent, yeah. he sent a lot of emails over the years and he shared a lot about his band. I, I just keep thinking, Adam is freaking awesome. I mean, his, <laughs> his concept of preparation, you know, and his grasp of, you know, taking care of the details so he can be successful, I think is pretty, as is obvious here, is pretty remarkable. Yeah. I mean, we talk about what's a professional. I would say if you want to run a successful able to deal with as many different variables that could come someone's way as possible cover band. Adam is the poster child for a, you know, a really awesome way to do things. He's, yeah. I, I, I think over the years of the, the number of times he sent in comments or suggestions or questions or, you know, he just is a really cool thinker and um, you know, it makes sense. Your goal is, your goal is not check out my fastball. Your your goal is to keep your feet moving, you know, like put a quality product on stage as off every time you go out and, and make people prepared with as much time in the cover band world often with it at being a, a side hustle for people or a second job. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case for Adam actually, but, but um, you know, how prepared can you be? to deal with every eventuality, including, yeah. you know, certain people not being available or breaking new people in or, you know, which are constant eventualities. Right. Yep. Yeah. No, it's, it's, he, he has certainly found a great way to run a cover band for sure. Uh, you know, I don't, the, the, the you haven't seen my fastball yet thing. I, I don't think that that line of thinking applies to being in an original band. I, I think that's sort of the point is you, you do want to impress people, but your fastball is your entire set, not just, you know, one song here or there. It's, you know, we're, we're going to, mm -hmm. we're out to impress. Mm -hmm. I, that doesn't mean you couldn't follow Adam's formula for the right original band either. Uh, you know, if, if your band is organized in the right way or in a way that fits, I don't want to say the right way because it means that anything else is the wrong way. But if your band is organized in a way that fits what, what Adam's doing, I, th I think it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's great. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, hats off to you, Adam. Yeah, man. Yeah. I have two pieces of gear. I want to talk about. I owe the people at Telefunken an apology, Paul. I've, I've spoken of the Telefunken M80 vocal mic before. 
it is a great vocal mic. I don't like it for me. Uh, I've always said that it's, a, it's just a weird pickup pattern on it. I, just, I don't like it. I got to Portland House of Music on Saturday night and about four bars into our sound check, I had completely changed my tune about this microphone. The engineer there, Ryan, had put the M80 that he has on the snare drum. I talked to him about it afterwards. He's like, yeah, I bought it as a vocal mic. I don't like it as a vocal mic, but man, it's the best snare drum mic I've ever found. I, I've never heard my snare drum sound so good in my ears before, ever. So I, I think I'm, I think I'm going to wind up buying one of these things to use as a snare mic. <laughs> it's, it really, it's fantastic. And, and I do know people for whom it is the right vocal mic, like Johnny D in Monkey Fist. It that that M80 is a perfect vocal mic for him. It he sounds cool. great with it. Just the way he approaches, you know, his mic technique and everything works really well. So I I have found a use for the M80, and I'm going to go buy one. So there's awesome. there's that. The other cool thing that I found this week is uh, Isotope makes all kinds of great plugins and apps for things. I use their Ozone to do mastering for all the Fling songs. Uh, and I use RX. Uh, the, they have a, an app called RX and now RX version 10 is out. I use RX to clean up audio if I, if, you know, if we do an interview and somebody's audio is crappy or whatever, it, it's really good at, you know, you can de-reverb things, which sounds like voodoo. And it is, uh, they've added voodoo in RX 10. Paul, I was able to take one of our episodes and put it into RX 10 and then search for words that either one of us said, and it found that segment of oh audio. And, what's that? You could play. You could play a uh, gig gab bingo. You could play gig gab bingo. In fact, that's right. Visit our Facebook group, listener. Oh, I think it's listener Rob, right? I, I'm pulling this from the top of my head. I'm pretty sure it was listener Rob created a bing, gig gab bingo card. Yeah, you could play bingo just by using RX and searching for words in the thing. What it also did, Paul, was it identified that there were two different speakers, and it was pretty much a hundred percent right on that. And so I could say, all right, well. Paul's audio was great, but Dave's audio was, was, you know, had too much something on it or whatever. And then I could, you know, you could say, oh, just, just affect the audio from this person, even though it's a mixed track. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah okay, no problem. A apply the effects to just that, you know, person's audio. It's amazing. I, like, I don't know how they do what they do, but I'm really glad that they do it. So if you need to clean up audio, Look no further. RX is the thing, and RX10 is the thing that adds the the voice, uh, the speech Very stuff. Cool. Yeah, it's freaking amazing. So, Paul, I mentioned that this week has been full of synchronicity. I went to Portland, Maine, in fact, where I played on Saturday night. Well, across the street from where I played on Saturday night. Uh, How I went, far is that from where you live? About an hour drive. Uh, it's a really right. easy drive. You get on the highway, you go, you get off the highway, you're there. It's super simple. Um and thankfully uh, for both all four of my legs of this, you know, out on Wednesday and back. And then of course out on Saturday and back, there was no traffic or anything. So yeah, mm -hmm. easy, easy. So we went on Wednesday night to Portland to see the Trey Anastasio band. And on this uh, little eight date fall tour, they have this band called goose opening for them. Goose has been of interest to me for a while. They, the primary reason is that they come from Norwalk, Connecticut, which is where I was born and where I lived for 20 plus years. So I was like, ah, hometown boys done good. You know, this is great. And they're in the jam band world. I've heard plenty about them, but I had never seen them knowing that I was going to see them. I started listening to them and I'll be honest. I, their, their music, <laughs> I don't know how kind what I'm about to say is, but my initial reaction on listening to, you know, eight to 10 tunes of theirs was, all of this sounds familiar, even though I've never heard it before. And it's as though someone took the entire fish catalog and had some machine learning engine ingest it all. And then the AI that was pointed at it spat out these <laughs> songs that Goose created. And like They can play their instruments really well. The songs are like quirky and mathy, which obviously for anybody that has listened long enough knows that that's the kind of one of the kinds of things that appeals to me. Right. So it was like, OK, I can get but it was nothing remarkable about this band. Nothing that that like hooked me to them. And I was like, OK, well, this is crazy because this band has like shot up in 2019. 
they were playing this club called Viva, Viva Zapata's. And to call it a club is a stretch. It's this crappy little Mexican restaurant in Westport, Connecticut. I played many a gig there when I was, you know, 30 years ago or whatever, maybe even longer. Uh, it's like, okay, well, they went in 2019 playing, you know, the Viva Zapata. Then they played some, you know, peach festival in Georgia. And then they were at Red Rocks and then Radio City. And now they're playing hockey arenas, co-billing, opening up for Trey Anastasio Band. To be clear, though, mm -hmm. Tab would never play venues of that size on their own. Like this is th the only way this tour works is that the two of these bands sort of draw enough of their own fan bases to to fill these, you know, larger rooms. Yeah. So I, I just went in really curious. And uh and I left the concert even more curious because they have no onstage personality. They sound fine. They haven't quite figured out how to make their instruments sound good in a large room like that. They're like the, 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 the bass and the keys are using too much of the EQ spectrum. They need to carve that out. They'll figure it out. And I say they'll figure it out because they've figured out everything else so far. So I'm confident they will figure that out. It wasn't terrible sound, but the, 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 the difference between they, they opened up the show. And then when tab played, it was like, okay, this room doesn't sound like crap. It, it was just the way they were, you know, EQ'd, uh, but they figured everything else out. So I th they'll, they'll get that. That's, that's fine. But they just, no real personality, no real crowd interaction, mm -hmm. but crowds love them. And it's like, okay, why, what's going on here? And so I've asked a lot of different people and I've, I've, I've dug deep because it's, you know, Hey, we've met, how you doing? Um, <laughs> and and tried to figure it out. And what they have done, near as I can tell, and we, you know, we had this conversation, uh, uh, I don't know, a month ago or so, maybe a month and a half ago, where uh, we brought Shannon Jean on. He's my co-host with Business Brain. And we talked about the business of music. And But I, in in retrospect, I would classify that as like the business of playing music. We talked a lot about the nuts and bolts of making sure you're managing the money and all of that stuff the right way. But on Business Brain, we talk about two things. There's this this idea, and I, I'm sure you've heard this before, Paul, where it's, you know, are you working in your business or are you working on your business? And what we talked about with Shannon was the in your business part of it, right? You're a member of this band. You're a working part of it. You're doing the things. You're grunting it out. You're making it happen, which is great. You need to. That's important. We didn't talk anything really about working on your business. And I think the people in Goose, near as I can tell, have really from all I would I would say from the get go have been focused on Goose the business because they have mm. capitalized on every opportunity that they have. And and here's and I also think they they treated Goose like a startup and and I'm I'm speculating here but I'm I'm using enough evidence to that at least it supports my speculation even if I'm wildly incorrect about my 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 um uh, my consensus here but I think they started this band with runway like you would a startup and when I say runway I mean cash or the ability to operate cash flow negative for a number of years and still do all the things that you need to do to grow the business. They were on the road for quite a bit of 2017, 2018, and even some of 2019, uh, just slogging it out in small clubs. But at almost every one of these, Paul, they had a full video rig done, like clearly far bigger than the budget of the club would allow. But what that meant was, they were creating high quality content that they were pushing to YouTube all the time and, and presumably, you know, segmenting it out and pushing to other socials to sort of drive that traffic and all of the things that you would do if you were running a business of a band and wanting to just keep growing. Uh, a friend of mine commented on a post I made somewhere and, and he says, yeah, I, I think of Goose as a band that failed up. They made themselves like failed in terms of cash flow. Right. Like they were they were operating at cash flow negative, but they but in doing so, they were making themselves seem bigger than they were. Right. You know, putting out these these great videos all the time uh, and and not expecting any money back for it or anything, just like pushing it out there to grow. And then COVID hit and they 
they had a bunch of b- gigs booked. Like they were moving up into larger venues, but all that had to be scrapped because of, you know, because of COVID lockdowns and all that. So they went to mm-hmm. Virginia or something and rented a barn or went to a barn. I don't know the specifics and did eight live stream shows from there that they charged money for. And th- uh, from those eight shows, they grossed a hundred grand. That means, a, and I think they were charging like five bucks for people to watch. So that's a yeah. lot, right? That's a lot of people, but they were delivering. They knew how already to deliver this, you know, high quality video content. They were delivering it to people that like all of us were starved for anything new because no music was being created. They pushed it out. Their social media game is really, really strong. Um, and, and that helped them just have this rapid rise to fame. And then they came out of COVID and they played Red Rocks. And then, you know, earlier this year, they played Radio City and they had Trey Anastasio sit in. Presumably at that point, the wheels were in motion for this tour that we're, you know, that's, that's happening now. They, but they, they clearly are really good at the business of Goose. And, and they mm. treated it like a startup. I, I, like whether they had, you know, family money or someone bankrolled. Like I, I don't know the specifics of that. And I don't even know that that is actually what happened. But looking at the, the map of things, that's the, the Occam's razor says that's what happened. And it's just fascinating to me because it's a, there's a lesson in here for all of us. We can treat our bands like they need and, and some bands need to be. Don't don't take this the wrong way. We can treat our bands like they need to be these cash flow positive machines pretty much out of the gate because you can't afford to play gigs without people, you know, getting paid and all that stuff. Or you can treat your band like a startup and invest everything into the band, operate cash flow negative, fund it somehow, somewhere else, and just focus on growing and growing and growing and growing. And eventually it'll start to pay off. And I'm assuming at this point, Goose is seeing that happen, but I can't say that for sure. Maybe they're still operating cash flow negative. What do I know? I don't know. I've talked a lot. What do you think, man? Well, I mean, certainly a lot of money changes hands based upon social re- social media reach, right? So it, you know, there's the there is the there there. Yeah. Uh, you know, once you ima- like, do you have any idea what their social media media following is? Uh, I, you know what? I don't, but I'll, I'll look it up while we, while we talk here. I mean, I, I, it's, you know, in the hundreds of thousands typically. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's, there's a foundation there to monetize and that's the whole premise. So on Twitter, they've got 22,000 followers. Um, Ah. yeah. Instagram, but you know, you only need a thousand. Instagram would be more interesting. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of my thought on it. So on Instagram, they have. A uh, hundred thousand followers, ninety five thousand. Yeah. Yep. Um, um, I'm looking. So on you Facebook. know, there's a fan base there. Yes. Something to build to, something to communicate well, to, yeah, something they, to ask somebody to refer somebody to. You know, I mean, but it, but in it, 20, there's, a, there's a whole. But in 2018, it wasn't that big. Right. Right. Like they've grown it. it over time. Facebook's seventy thousand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know what? Actually, the thing that's going through my mind right now is like the work it takes to do that. And it takes work. Yes. It's work. Correct. It's Absolutely. Why, it is why the, oh, this is my hobby. I do it for the love. You know, it, it is it is really the, the opposite end of people who just take up the space because they want to indulge playing for their girlfriends. Right. It, Absolutely. It is the, 100%. The, yeah. These guys are focused on the business of goose. I don't want to take anything away from their their ability to play their instruments they are spectacular musicians and great yeah. singers their harmonies i wish i could have heard them better but their harmonies are also fantastic like they, they you know their songs are uh, not not anything special but mm-hmm. you know their light show's good that also takes money you know <laughs> so yeah i don't know yeah it's an interesting thing but they the business of goose and so you know the business of your band out there folks what Think about this. Is there is there a, a there there for for the rest of us? And it's not just the business. Like you know, Adam is running the business of the Van Band, right? I mean, that that's yes. is, what, what what we're saying here is is the business of creating an, an a nice soft landing, a foundation of fans using everything at your disposal to do that. And it's not just a, a an iPhone video and putting 
marginal content up. It's well lit, well yep. recorded, you know, and consistent, really you well. relentless. Yeah. yeah. So this weekend, I, you know, so all of this came together, obviously, in a, you know, four day period for me. And these gigs we played with Bella's were really eye opening. It was like, wow, okay, so there is an angle for Bitter Pill here because people loved us at these gigs. I couldn't get, I, you know, I had to bring like my snare drum and my cymbals back to my car. And in order to do that on Saturday, you know, I had to walk through the club. Actually, I had to do it on, on Friday too. I couldn't get to and from the stage without six people in each direction stopping me and just mm -hmm. gushing about the show that we just put on, which is, don't get me wrong. That's friggin' awesome. You know, there was a logistical issue because I didn't want to be a jackass and leave stuff in their way, <laughs> but, uh, but it's awesome. Yeah. You know, uh, but you know, I, I already, I went into these gigs after having given all the, the, uh, members of bitter pill, my dissertation about goose that I had just shared here on the show that happened on like Thursday. Cause I woke up and I'm like, okay, what the heck is going on? But after our shows this weekend, I thought, okay, we need to start doing, you know, I like your term that, that you talked about, uh, you shared with me years ago. I'm sure you've used it forever. The, the idea of blocking the, this concept of blocking and tackling the things that you just do as a matter of course in your business to get thing, to keep things moving forward. And for goose blocking and tackling means it includes among everything else, creating high quality videos of every single show, right? Like that's part of what they do. And so I thought, well, we don't have high quality videos of these shows. We got to figure out how to do that for Bitter Pill. And, and, and we've got the wheels moving and we're, we're trying to figure it out. But I figured, what can we do? So, you know, we, like, uh, we have a pretty good social media game. It's mostly managed by Emily and Billy Butler uh, in the band. And, and they, do, they do great with, with that. But it's like, okay, what can we do to support that? What can we do to add content for that? What can we do to just build up the story that is bitter pill so that when people discover us, there is depth there when they go deep on Sunday morning, because they just saw this band last night. What are they going to find? How deep can we create this thing? How can we make it look like we're bigger than we are? And I thought, you know what I like to do when I've seen a band for the first time or sometimes for the 10th time is I, I like to go to setlist.fm and look up where else they've played how much their set lists vary from night to night. You know, I like if I want to be a nerd about something, I want to be a nerd about it. And so I put our two set lists from this weekend up on, uh, on setlist.fm and really fleshed them out with notes and everything. And now I'm going to go back and put every date that I, that I know of that bitter pill has ever played on setlist.fm. I won't be able to flesh out every set list cause I don't have them all, but I have a lot of them. I save most of them. And so, you know, I can, I can start filling that out to give people something to sink their teeth into when the show is over. And I, I think there's like, that's, we need, we all need to think more about that with our bands. I think, uh, you know, if you, if you want to have real fans, people that come out, that show up and see you and love you, that's great. But in order to get them to come back to the next show, you need to give them more than just the date for the next show uh, or, it's, yeah. you know, so yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You can tell I'm like, you know, the wheels are turning. Yeah. I actually get the sense that there's something going on with this bitter. Like I know you and you've been in a lot of bands and yeah. you, you know, you're a musician's musician, but you have a little bit of a spark when you talk about the opportunity here in bitter pill. It's different than most things I've heard you talk about. Yep. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> you know, we started it. You're right. I, I started to notice it last summer and talked about that here on the show that, you know, people are coming out and more people to every gig, people that we don't know are showing up with our T-shirts on, singing the lyrics. You know, there, there's something about this band that that works with people. And and it has a, a, a level of of it's a it's a different kind of band. I don't want to say unique because that that's an overused word, but it's different. And, and there's something here that people don't get everywhere else. And uh, and so there's opportunity in that. And, and yeah. yeah, yeah. I yeah. wish you the best. Ride it, my brother. Thanks. Yeah, we are. That's it. The whole, everybody in the band is into riding this and, and not just riding it, but pushing it and seeing, mm -hmm. seeing what happens. I mean, the worst thing that happens is we fail. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> we join a lot of other good people if we fail, <laughs> including <laughs> ourselves in, in past projects, right? <laughs> like, it's fine. Failure's all right. 
So let's see where we can go. We have vinyl now. Go. I'm I, I I realized I'm pretty sure this bitter pill. We did a vinyl release for our our current album, the one we released this year, "Living Ain't Cheap, Dying Ain't Free." And I'm pretty sure it's the first time I've ever been on vinyl. Mm, that's cool. Yeah. You know, um, the great Bill Tasto, our sound guy. I do know the great Bill Tasto. Right? Yeah. And yeah, he just got, took delivery of his bitter pill CD. Amazing. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love to hear that. That's great. That's great. Cool. Yeah, it's crazy. So I want to hear what you folks think about this whole idea of working in the business of your band versus working on the business of your band. Cause I, I think there's something that can sort of, you know, the rising tide raises all ships here. I think we can help each other with this folks. I think there's, there's something to be, there's a there there. In the meantime, I had a rehearsal yesterday, Paul, I was super exhausted for it. Uh, but we're doing rumors this week, uh, with diaspora radio, my friend Stu, you know, we do the, uh, he does every month an album, uh, performance of an album in track order. And this month I am joining him um, along with several other people mm -hmm. and we're doing rumors. The band is killer. Uh, everybody mm -hmm. can play and sing. We've got seven people singing on pretty much every song. And it's amazing how well it's coming together. So we're, we play that gig on Thursday. We'll, we'll have right. one less rehearsal than I would like to have, but that's always true. So uh, we'll see how it goes. But, um, but I'll, I'll report back next week, of course. So, looking forward to it. Yeah, man. What else we got? Is that is that the end, or or do we have That's more? A good Monday night for me, man. Yeah, man. Same, same. Yeah, I'm glad we. Uh, it feels like, like as I was looking at our agenda for this week, and by the way, we skipped like four things. Just so you know, it's fine mm -hmm. that we, you know, we'll 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 talk about them in the future. But uh, as I was looking at our agenda, it's like well, we haven't been off for three weeks like we were before. But yet, you know, here you are, all you folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. That's where uh, that's where you sent all the good stuff. Thank you. And that's where we're always performing. Always be performing. Yeah, man. Ah. We'll see you next week, folks. Have a good one. Good day. Later. Later.